I'm gonna, this is going to be split up into kind of two parts. I'm going to cover basically what the technique is, how we got to it, and some basics about it, and then Matt's going to take over and talk about some of the follow-on stuff and some interesting applications at the end. All right. So, first of all, I'm going to tell you uh, a story. It's a little unorthodox way to present this kind of lecture thing. But um, when I was in the Army, I knew this guy named Kenny Brook, who was famous for doing all kinds of weird stuff. But one time he bought a video game that he couldn't run to get into the video card. So he went and bought a video card. He messed around with it for about two days and couldn't get it to work. Right? So <coughs> the part about our being in the Army is important at this point because we went uh, out to the field for a month. So he comes back, he's playing with the video card some more, still can't get it to work. And he's getting frustrated because now it's been a month since he opened the box and he can't return any stuff and he's getting frustrated. So he calls the motherboard manufacturer for his uh, his computer and they tell him you cannot disable the onboard video for that particular model. And so out of frustration he goes to his kitchen and he gets a, uh, an ice pick. And he finds where the video chip is on the motherboard and stabs it a few times with the ice pick. <laughs> if I can't disable it in firmware, I'm going to disable it physically. Right? So he turns on the machine and it buzzes in an uncomfortable way. He turns it off, <laughs> takes the ice pick and stabs it a bunch more times. <laughs> then he turns the machine back on, it posts, it recognizes the new video card, he plays the video game and everything works out. <laughs> so I told him he needs to work, you know, at the Best Buy Geek Squad thing because he's got a future in computer repair, but he didn't take me to um, So why did I tell you this ridiculous story? Um, Kenny Brook, like me and Matt, tried something that was pretty stupid and had pretty nice results. And that's significant because this is not, <clears throat> like most of the BoostCon lectures, a serious business lecture where we're going to say, this is the library you should be using, it's going to make your life better, this is where the C++ language is going or anything like that. We're simply saying we found this really neat technique and we want to uh, kind of share it with the community. All right. And I just like telling this story. All right, so first of all, the problem. What were we doing when we came up with this technique? What were we were trying to solve? So, uh, first of all, template meta programming is great stuff, right? We all like doing this, or we probably wouldn't be in this room. Uh, it allows you to do lots of nice stuff, like, you know, if you use expression templates, it's going to optimize the code for you in some cases. It's going to make it more expressive. You're going to catch errors earlier, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, it just makes you look better to your coworkers. And that's a pretty good <laughs> for a lot of people, right? So, we want to do this. Sorry. Okay, so we want to do this as much as we can, but the problem is that it's really frustrating when you get into any significant amount of template meta programming. You start having these long compile times if you're not careful about what you're doing, and that can really like kill your effort to to use template meta programming in real world situations. Okay, so this is because template instantiation just does a lot of stuff. Uh, if you want to get the skinny on this, talk to Doug Greger, and there's lots of Stuff that maybe you wouldn't even anticipate that's going on when you instantiate a template. There's a lot of great compilers to do. And some specific compilers like GCC before 4.5 had quadratic sort of behavior for large amounts of template instantiation, which made it really bad no matter how careful you are. Um, okay, so some boost examples. Um, Proto uses macro workarounds for a lot of stuff, as Eric has mentioned before at BoostCon, that he was getting really long compile times and he decided he's going to do a lot of the metaprogramming pieces in the preprocessor instead of doing them. Uh, in, the, um, in the template system, and that made a lot of the compile times much more palatable. And Spirit, um, if you write sort of naive Spirit 1 code, you can get compilation units or translation units that, that take 10 minutes to compile and you know, are hundreds of megabytes in size of the resulting object file. All right, so this is the solution we came up with. <coughs> so don't instantiate templates, right? That's the solution. Um, and that's completely stupid, right? So we had this idea that if you don't reach in here and say colon colon type, you're not instantiating the stuff inside the template. You can somehow avoid doing that and still do all the, the type expressive stuff that you want to do, then you're going to somehow avoid template instantiation. Now this turns out not to really be true, but we thought it at the time. So that's where we were starting off from. So in this case, we've got some meta function that does something and makes this type def type. And user code is going to instantiate this template with some type and then reach in and grab its type parameter, then do something, or it's a nested type, and do something with it. Um, 
So we wanted to avoid doing that wherever possible, not having colon colon appear anywhere and not having nested types as the basic mechanism for metaprogramming. Okay, so the insight here was that, you know, decal type exists in the OX standard specifically to prevent you from rewriting a function as the equivalent meta function that tells you what the type of the regular runtime function is going to be. And if we use that and this um, trailing return type syntax with you know, the auto decal type tree, um, then we should be able to do a lot of stuff um, you know, without reaching in and grabbing out type, uh, nested uh, type type. Right. So I'm gonna go over those two um, parts of the C++ OX syntax in a minute for people who are not familiar. I think most people would be pretty familiar with that so we've kind of glossed over it. <coughs> okay, so decal type, the loose terms, gives you the type of some expression that you give to it, um, which means that this example where we have some plus operation that's generic, we have to have some meta function that says what the result of that plus is gonna be based on the types T and U. Um, it allows you to take that sort of pattern and turn it into something like this, where you say, I've got the operative plus, the compiler has to know what this turns out to be anyway, so I'm gonna ask decal type what that is, and that's my return type. <coughs> and this whole dance here, you know, is to avoid doing, you know, using these types in a way that they might not be usable as because they're generic, you might not be able to default construct them and stuff like that. So. Now the returning tra uh, the trailing uh, return type syntax uh, basically allows you to use the auto keyword <coughs> on the front and catch the stuff that you specify with decal type from the back and thus define the return type in terms of the actual parameter. So instead of doing this dance here to keep from instantiating you know, a T and a U, um, we say, okay, I'm gonna take the actual T and U that you pass to this function and I say, if I were to do the plus operation on that T and that U, what's the return type gonna be? And auto says, expect that and catch that when decal type is able to do that. Now, the decal type expression has to come last because you haven't seen T and U uh, up here. So that's why you can't put decal type at the front um, as you did up here. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too quick for everybody now. Yeah. Isn't that infinite recursion? <coughs> In this case it is. Yeah, it's Defining operator plus in terms of operator plus. plus. In terms of Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I told you it was stupid. Again. Okay. So this is sort of the scaffolding that we're going to use for all the approaches. Well, that's great. All right. So this is the the you know the sort of back matter for the first approach. Um, we have um, something that looks a lot like the MPL vector, except that we cut out all the sort of nested stuff inside the MPL vector. But basically, you know, we've got what looks like an empty vector and then a way of describing uh, you know, a vector that's not empty in terms of deriving from something that's got just the tail in it and then uh, adding it. Um, and this pattern is not strictly necessary. We'll see, um, I think we'll see later on that there's a you know, simpler definition of vector that we're using. But this was our first approach because we're trying to take what was in the MPL and sort of reproduce it. Okay, so the first approach is Disgusting, right? Um, we've got <coughs> I was writing pointer. We've got this big mess up here, right? And I'm gonna think of it in the reverse order because it's a little easier. So this is a pointer to function that returns a t, okay? And this is a pointer to function that returns a vector of args without the t that we're pushing back. So <coughs> um, those are parameters. <laughs> in a pointer to function called pushback that returns the vector with the args and then the t pushed back. So what we've done here basically is encoded the type information in pointers to function so that we can avoid the nested type def type thing, okay? Um, and the good news is it does what we wanted to right down here. As an aside, you could have used uh, auto and arrow to clean up the uh, declaration of that thing returning the pointer to function. Because you, if you return pointer to function, you have to wrap the types around. If you use auto and arrow, you can get that pointer to function type all the way on the right. And that's a little bit cleaner. 
Because that function is returning a pointer to a function taking nothing and returning vector r instead of that t. Well, no, I think this is a pointer function, right? Well, the pushback is a, is that a pointer function or yeah. a function yeah. taking two pointers and returning a pointer? It's, no, it's a pointer, a pointer function. function. Oh, it is. Okay. It's a template decora declaration of mm -hmm. pointer function type. Okay. Um, the name of the pointer function is pushback. Um, but there's no actual function here yet. Uh, okay. Oh, wait a second. There's no such thing as a templated object. I think, yeah. I think he was right. Well, no, that is a function. It's a, it's a, that's a function declaration. What? Function it's template a function. declaration. It's not a pointer. It's a function. It looks like a function taking two yeah. pointers to functions and returning a third pointer to functions. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is. And that could have been cleaned up with an auto. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So this was the first draft. So. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I actually dug this up from last year. What? He's not saying it's wrong. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I, I understand. But uh, yeah, that's why I'm saying we're not using things like auto decal type. We're, we're going to do that in a minute, but the reason we're not doing that here is because we were really uh, walking around in the dark at this point. Okay, so like I said, it works, but it's disgusting. You would never want to write code like that uh, and try to make it. Okay. So one now, approach I, is to automate the wrapping part a little bit, right? So instead of encoding stuff in uh, pointer to function, maybe encode them using this struct wrap. It doesn't have a definition, and all right, we're we're getting away from definitions, so there's not going to be any nested types and no template instantiations, right? Well, not really, but we'll get to that again. Okay, so and then you've got unwrap, which does just what you would expect it to do, except that um, for you know reasons you'll see in the next slide, we've got pointers to a wrap T that we're unwrapping instead of just a wrap T. Okay. Okay, so here we have the pushback again. That instead of returning a pointer function, it's returning a pointer to a wrapped thing that's the result type that we want. And it's taking two arguments that are respectively the wrapped vector before we did pushback and then the wrapped t. Um, and of course, in every case, we've got a pointer to the wrapped thing, not the wrapped thing. And, and um, we're doing that so we don't have to have a body for wrap as soon as you try to return uh, that wrap you know, that, that wrap type. Uh, and it's not a point where you're going to be looking for copy constructors and things like that. We don't want to stand too. Uh, we don't want to fully define it. That's what you say. So again, it does what we want it to do. It returns a vector to back. So this is a lot better. Um, so I'm probably missing something stupid here. Why, why do we need wrap and unwrap? Why can't we simply push back taking a vector stuff star and a t star and returning a vector other stuff star? What, what's wrap and unwrap helping us to avoid? Well, there's there's two issues. But one of them is that there's certain types you can't pass to functions without them. Uh, oh, but what if devolving. you stick on a pointer? You can't. Yeah. Yeah. You can't. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That does it. So there's all kinds of stuff you might want to do in a truly generic context. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's better, right? But it's not a lot better. All right. So <clears throat> the third um, solution basically has realizing that you know, the wrapping mechanism could be changed, and the specific way that makes it work a lot better is to have this type function that just returns the wrap thing, and we, we change it using uh, references instead of, uh, of pointers, and, and you'll see why in the next slide. Now, the interesting thing is I added a, a, an actual definition here of this struct, but um, it's not strictly necessary. The only reason it's necessary is that um, without that definition, um, MPL print chokes. <coughs> And so you don't get good output from MPL print, and so I had to add that. But it works fine without that, as long as you don't need to print the result, you just need to use it. <coughs> and then uh, unwrap, you know, just like before we does something uh, very similar. It just takes a reference to this, uh, you know, wrap type, and it takes the T parameter out of it. Okay, so um, this still allows us to leave the, you know, types incomplete where possible um, by using the, uh, the, the reference instead of the pointer. And um, it requires the type and unwrap calls, but only at the library boundary. So you're going to see at, in you know, the further stuff that we're going to show you in the next few slides that um, we're essentially wrapping things. And we put them into the system, and we're unwrapping only the end result. We're keeping everything wrapped internally all the time. So all the sort of interfaces for the, uh, uh, you know, the algorithms that operate on vectors or the things that create vectors or whatever assume that you pass them wrapped stuff. So if you do at on this vector, um, it, it's going to unwrap the result, but it's going to expect that vector is wrapped when it gets it. 
Okay, so here once again we have this function that looks a lot like the other two, but I've introduced this vector thing here, which basically is a function that returns the already wrapped uh, vector of the, the types that, that you've given it. And um, this works a lot like the stuff that in the previous slide. I've got some element that I want to push back, and I better have passed it in pre-wrapped, and then I've got some vector of t's without the element, uh, and I better have passed it in pre-wrapped. And then what I get back is the pre-wrapped vector of t and then this wrapped element. So um, the interesting thing is that the result now is all of a sudden vector of type int you know, reference instead of vector of int. And that's because, like I said, the you know, convention that we've adopted is that everything's going to stay wrapped all the time. Again, if you were to call at on, uh, if you call at right here and then put a you know, compile time zero, then you would get out int, not a wrapped int. But for now, it's just going to be, stay, it's going to stay wrapped while it's in there. All right. Okay, so <coughs> this has some nice features, right? It, it um, sort of does what we thought we wanted to do, which is we're not instantiating any struct definitions. Um, it's um, a lot more readable than standard uh, template parameter code that's based on template structs. Uh, and it allows, hopefully, mere mortals to read TMP code written by others. Um, that is fairly expressive. I mean, if you, you know, understand what decal type does, then this becomes a lot easier to understand. But you know, even if you don't understand that, you're kind of digging through someone else's code. You can kind of get the gist pretty easily. How many mere mortals know what decal type is? Uh, well, that's a lot easier to teach than, um, you know, how to read MPL code for an office I think. So. <coughs> okay, so um, there's a lot more teachable because of that, and it's just cool because you never got used to seeing this, right? All right, so it's still a standard struct declarations, right? And um, it turns out that we're just moving all the work that you used to do in the definition in the declaration anyway. Um, and so the compile time performance is kind of iffy. Um, so I did some compile time performance measures. Um, the test was really simple. I just took an empty vector and I pushed back, you know, like a couple hundred hints, and it's all, you know, nested into one statement. And I did that about ten times. Um, the test methodology was I did I just ran that um, compile ten times in a row, and then ran ten times in a row again, saved the second set of ten, and put up that average. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just sort of giving us an idea because, first of all, we didn't have a lot of this, you know, uh, version of MPL sort of implemented. And what you really want to do is implement the whole thing using MPL and then use something that is a heavy user of uh, MPL and compare the differences, right? Like the version that would have used MPL and then the version that, uh, or in fact, the, ver the version that does use MPL and then the version that uses um, the new version of the library of new technique. We don't have any kind of test like that, so you know, take this with a big grain of salt. Um, okay, so actually something interesting before I talk about these numbers is when we were doing this on um, a laptop last year when we kind of came up with this technique, I was getting a 20% uh, degradation in performance instead of an increase. And then also when I went to a four core desktop machine, I was getting you know roughly 25% uh, for GCC4, or X. Uh, I can't explain this. I have no idea why that's happening. We also had some fairly simple constructs that when we tried to compile them um, would sit and think for a while and then blow up because they ran out of memory. So it's, you know, it's not even alpha. It's not stable. But um, the good news is we're not doing any worse. Uh, something kind of interesting, GCC 4.5 um, got uh, quite a bit better at doing the MPL code because they fixed their um, uh, quadratic lookup situation and our code got um, slower to compile. Again, I have no, no explanation for any of these things, but you know, our original goal was to make uh, template meta programming faster and we really didn't. <laughs> so it's kind of a wash. But I think that the syntactic sugar element of it is pretty compelling and, and uh, it's a lot of fun Okay, so we called this FTMPL for function template MPL. And um, this is just what I had for the version three um, uh, attempt at the technique. 
except that um, you know I'm using our actual uh, headers for vector and, and type and wrapping them. Uh, and then uh, we've got this thing that puts the unwrap and decal type um, calls in one line because it's just kind of literally in the brain. Okay, so <clears throat> because decal type is the underlying mechanism that allows us to do this, we can do some pretty neat stuff with expressions. So um, here I've written a simple plus with these two objects that I'm pretending to create and then giving to decal type. And decal type tells me that uh, that's an int 9 value. So um, <coughs> it just prevents you from writing, you know, plus with uh, passing in int 3 and int 6 as two template parameters. All right, so it makes it markedly more readable. If you have enough of this stuff, it's probably a lot more readable. And we also have, you know, uh, an unwrap value macro which does uh, the unwrapping and then uh, grabs the value out instead of the type. And if I change the plus to uh, uh, bitwise and, I get uh, two, just like I expect. I'm, I'm a little confused. Is that type int yeah. underscore? Is that the MPL int underscore? No, no, no. That's our int underscore, which is oh. virtually identical. Okay. I mean, it's the same idea. But you've overloaded the operators to, to generate new types? Yeah, well, we've got, um, or actually, I think we might, we, we, okay, I think we have a type called int t, and we have a function called int underscore that returns an int t. But it's wrapped, yeah. But it's a wrapped int t is what this function returns. Yeah. yeah. But I was just wondering where those operators are defined. Oh, um, they're defined in, um, I think we've got like a, what's called numeric.h or something like that. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're defined in the same yeah. space as the wrapping mechanism. Okay. Right. So they can be picked up by, And so, I mean, here I'm, I'm uh, sort of assuming you're using namespace boost ftmpl. Um, most of the examples are good. Okay, so this is pretty nice. This is this same um, implemented with this technique. And the nice thing is you've just got two call operators, and uh, they just do a little bit of pattern matching. They return false if you give it two different types, and true if you give it the same type. And um, so here you, you know, use the this same T and train one as a temporary and pass it a, uh, uh, a type wrapped char and another type wrapped char and then you get back the whole true, right? Also this is, I mean, you could also type def, we actually do have type def in another, in another version where rather than doing type false T, you just do false underscore. And similarly for true underscore T wrap, just true underscore. Okay, so this is not really a fair test, but I'm just giving you some idea of like, you know, because this became sort of the selling point of the library at, uh, you know, um, after the fact that, I think it's bigger. Is Jeff Garland here? He knows how to fix it. Yeah, let me show you how to do it. Maybe he showed me how to do it. All right. Did you unlock it? So, um, yeah, you just got it. Oh, very good. Nice. So, nice. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it bigger. All right, well, you don't need to see the titles, do you? Uh, I think it's just real zero. That's what I'm doing. I think it will disappear. Yeah, leave it alone. Jeff said that uh, it doesn't disappear, so we'll see what happens. Anyway. So, you know, um, here we're using the size up trick, right, um, uh, to tell if the two things we're passed, the template parameters, are the same type. And essentially, all decal type does is the you know, short circuit the need to use the size up trick by giving you the actual type instead of saying, I'm going to say that, you know, this result is, is um, alias to this true type and this other result is alias to the false type, and then I'm going to look at the size of the result and then from that, you know, Return uh, you know the true type of false data. Okay. So again, I'm probably missing something obvious here. Um, isn't is same best implemented with a partial specialization, or is this simply a workaround for compilers that don't have that expose that's, their yeah? That's a good question. I, I don't answer that. I mean, I, I basically okay. just this seems to be a little unfair. It's, it's, it's an unfair. Yeah. 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 I, that's why I said it's a little unfair. But um, one thing that's interesting though. Uh, 
our example does not use partial template specialization because right. it's just overloaded templates. So both of them do accomplish but you're running, what you need decal set. So are you running uh, partial ordering uh, when you resolve which function is going to be called? I guess for the is same, it seems like you are because you have to run partial ordering to determine that LREP, LREP is better than LREP RREP, right? It should activate the same sort of logic in the compiler. I'm no compiler expert, so okay. <laughs> Well, I'm, I am, I'm not either. Uh, I'm just a library dev. But if I give you like a, uh, you know, a short or <coughs> long, something that's to decide that LR is better than LL, and that's the partial ordering rules in the standard, okay. which I think act like partial specialization. All right. Well, I don't know if so. It would be expensive. Uh, yeah. I, like I said, I mean, mm -hmm. looking at the really simple test, it doesn't look like there's a big game of performance ones. I don't know if um, this makes it. Usable with a wider variety of implementations. I, I don't know if So, right, like I said, I mean, it, it is an unfair comparison because it's probably a workaround because this was written in the MSBC6 era. <laughs> I'm going to guess. It I was. don't really know, though. Yes, it was. Okay. And that's that's why it doesn't use partial specialization. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So. so, in other words, it's your fault, Stephen. It's, yeah, it's, well, it's our fault. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're not your It's more my fault. I was in that group. Get him! <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, here we have a higher order meta function apply. Right. It takes some meta function as a wrap type. It takes some arguments, and then it applies the meta function to the arguments. Okay. Um, so. Now, like I said before, the whole point of the, the auto decal type trick is that you can avoid putting stuff like this in your decal type expression by just using, um, you know, some uh, actual uh, template parameter. I mean, not template parameter, but actual parameter right there. Um, and that was the whole point of putting it behind the, you know, main function declaration. But the interesting thing is when we tried to do that, it blew up GCC because this is a very you know, first draft of their sort of decal type all this stuff and very out of templates and that. There's some interactions there that they weren't counting on. So we ended up doing stuff that ironically, even though we're using the C OX syntax, you could put the decal type stuff at the beginning and then instead of using decal type, you could use, you know, um, Stevens hack for getting MSBC to return you the type and uh, you know type of stuff from GCC. And you could do this most of it except for the very out of template stuff in C so, but um, that's not the point of the slide. The point of the slide is that apply, uh, at least as written here, is dog simple, right? Now, this is also not a uh, terribly fair comparison because, in fact, you can't probably write apply like this, and you're going to see a more complicated apply that, you know, knows how to accept binds and, and, and interoperate with bind and fold and various other kinds of um, operations. And so uh, that's going to be something that, that Matt will show you. And so it's going to get more complicated, but. The point of showing this, and then uh, I'm going to show you a simple fold on the next one, is that if you are writing some template metaprogramming code, and it's just for your use, and it doesn't have to interoperate with a bunch of other stuff, and be truly generic uh, and, and useful in the library, this could be a really nice technique for making really expressive, really readable template metaprogramming code. So, and again, just like before, it's uh, you know, just what you would expect. You give it a, a char, and, and those are not the same. Way. And you get a full false. The so. is same thing does it take wrap or on wrap? Um, the is same here, right? It's the same one from before. And yeah, it takes, uh, it's expecting the stuff to be wrapped, but ultimately it doesn't matter in that particular case because it's just, I mean, properly I should have written that as, you know, wrapped L and wrapped R, but. I was just an oversight. Okay, so this is um, fold. Again, this is a simplified fold that doesn't interoperate with apply and bind and, and all that sort of stuff you would have to uh, interoperate with. But it just shows you that you know fold is, is sort of a conceptually difficult thing. It was certainly difficult for me when I was first learning about template programming and to implement it uh, sort of so succinctly is. is Pretty nice. So just to break it down for you, um, all this is doing is taking some 
template parameter function in some initial state, a head and a tail, and then um, if you give it a wrapped function, a wrapped initial state, uh, oh, so that's the other thing, is that this is specialized for vector T, it's not taking care of iterators or generic sequences, another change we obviously want to make. Um, but if you take this, um, you know, vector T, which has a wrapped head and then a tail, then the return type you get from this is recursion into a full with the same function with your new state, which is um, made by making a temporary function and then calling it with your state and, and your current state in your head and then recursing down by passing in the tail part. And then of course that's the basis case up there, which expects um, an empty vector to give you just the current state. Does that make sense? I mean, I hope it does. I mean, this is really straightforward um, to write, I feel. So, um, that's kind of I'm sure you know. All right. Okay, this is another unfair comparison because Fold, if you look at the implementation, is doing all kinds of stuff to, um, you know, get lots of code reuse to make sure there's not typos, there's macros all over the place that are enforcing the um, you know, naming conventions and stuff. And of course, the implementation is elsewhere. Um, and I really just didn't want to make slide after slide after slide of fold implementation, so that's why I've just got the sort of interface for it here. But you know, as a as a programmer that's going to look at some template meta programming code that was written, if I'm not familiar with all the techniques and familiar with this library, I'm immediately lost here. And hopefully, in the other place, I can sort of piece it together. Um, again, though, it's not you know a fair comparison because this fold is doing a lot more, but you'll see a fold that, that does uh, effectively the same stuff, um, and that's piece. Okay, so um, this is usually something people do at the end of their slides, but because there's sort of a break between the stuff that me and Matt did initially and the stuff that when we mentioned it to Stephen Watanabe and, and David Abrahams, and they just ran with it and were implementing stuff faster than we could understand what they were writing, um, they ended up uh, you know. Dave made this MPLLX um, get repo, and then uh, Steven yeah. folded it. And there's some slight differences yeah. between these two. Yeah. I don't know how functional they are, um, but I can tell you that the MPL stuff is quite non-functional. <laughs> so you know, to get your hopes up, but it's certainly interesting to look at some of the stuff we've got in there, um, just out of curiosity. It's not something that's production ready by any stretch of the imagination. Any questions? This is. Um, the place I'm stopping for questions on this part because this is the sort of gentle introduction part of the um, lecture. So if anything is unclear, let's go right now before we move on to that stuff. Um, I guess my my question is about the the history of these ideas. I guess I don't remember it quite the way you do. We had this session on on OX features and and exploring them and how they could be uh, used in boost libraries. And one of the things that I was doing with people was talking about like working on on MPL and I said that there's you know you could do everything with function calls and avoid template instantiations and all of that stuff and that was that was here that's my memory of it so you and you and Matt came up with this first I, I, I me and Matt and, and Stephen Watanabe were pointing yeah, it over a, I guess yeah I mean it's, it's not like I need to have credit for this but it but I'm confused I'm not trying to steal credit for this, but this is something that me and Matt were talking about on our own based on yeah, the... We, we um, had gone to lunch at one point and we were talking about this and then we came up to you, we approached you with the idea and that was basically how it Oh, all right. Fine. Okay, so besides that question... Okay, all right, so now it's all... <laughs> We'll get to that. You said when's it going to be a production library? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I would guess never. Right. And yeah. I'll get into I mean, that. Why? <laughs> why that's the case. But, I mean, there's st there still is a possibility that it may, but I'll, well, I'll explain it in a bit. Okay. I have one question. Are there fundamental reasons why uh, the compile time isn't? Uh, Doug Craig would probably be the best person to answer that. But yeah, that was our initial, you know, if we eliminate all the struct definitions, then obviously definitions aren't being instantiated, then it's not a problem. But apparently just instantiating declarations and like, it, it, it's just apparently equally as bad. 
one, one way to look at it is that there, there's as much information in the, in the types of those, the types of those templates, those function templates whose signatures get instantiated as there is in the body of those structs that represent the metafunctions. So you end up with the, essentially the same problem. It has to build a data structure that's got equivalent information in it. But you're not adding stuff to the single table, are you? Yeah, you are. You're, add, you're adding each, each one of those function template instantiations is a new, uh, is a new symbol, essentially. They, go, they all get mangled differently in their, their unique functions in the, in the system. So it does. So eliminating definitions doesn't really solve what we were hoping to solve. All right, so um, I'm going to continue. Uh, just I'm going to cover some higher order functions and some definitions of them. Fold, uh, Zach already went over a little bit, but I'm going to show improved fold. This is one that uh, Dave implemented. And then um, I'm going to go over bind, which is uh, Stephen Nadavi's bind. And a quickly built uh, transform that uses uh, bind. And um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the lambda expression. In this thing. Okay, so this is a slightly different fold from the one that Zach showed. And um, the first thing that's different is everything is stored in a struct. And I'm sure anybody who's worked with C is familiar with this. And the reason why you often do this is because if the overloads are packed in a struct, you can pass it off to you know, something like fold. And um, it'll work perfectly fine. You obviously can't pass an overloaded function to another function. So this kind of Makes that easier. So here's the definition. Um, first off, we have um, uh, takes a function, an initial state, and a sequence. And right here, notice that we just refer to it as a sequence. We're not, you know, um, specifying that it has to be particularly a vector or a list or whatever. So it's a it's a generic function. And um, I use a little bit of a different layout here. It's auto operator, and then you see the trailing arrow decal type over there. I personally just adopted this kind of way of laying it out because it more resembles um, actual functions. So like the arrow deco type, in a way resembles you know, a member function that's common. And the uh, open parentheses here very much resemble open curly bracket and close curly bracket. And the only difference is there's a semicolon. So okay, here's the definition. We start with the function. We apply the function with the initial state from the front of the sequence. and we recurse passing it along um, the shortened sequence with the, the head chopper. And so pop front is defined for this sequence. I'm not showing the definition. It's pretty trivial. Um, and then we finally have to have our basis case. And this is um, just returns the state. And before I go any further, um, there should be a couple questions that I'm expecting yeah, about. How do you choose between those two overloads? Exactly. OK. <laughs> So initially, um, I guess there's, there's really two questions. And one of them is, why is it? This should be ambiguous, right, first, first of all. And the reason why it's not ambiguous is because when you have a sequence of size 0, pop front can't be defined. And there's literally no definition. And so, so with extended spine, this gets picked. But then you have the other issue, which is if it's not an empty sequence, how does it get picked? Because now they both matches. And the reason for that is because, um, what is it? Slight, slight difference there. That one's type wrap. This is not. That's a better match. <laughs> so it's a little, it's, it's interesting, a little confusing. <laughs> you could blame Dave for this, by the way. He's going to do this. I came up with that not type wrap thing. You came up with this with what? I came up with the not type wrap thing? Yes, you did. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's horrible. Yeah, I know. Get him. But again, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that this is something that you should do. You might want, you probably want to, if you were to actually write this, you know, choose a different approach. But I mean, this does have some advantages in, in that it's much shorter to write, it's very simple. I like how you're crediting Dave for the bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next is much more complicated. This is uh, Steve Watanabe's bind implementation. Um, I just want to say, as soon as we started uh, working with this approach, um, I, I came up to Steve and Dave and 
we all were kind of mingling. And uh, it was towards the end of the day, I think. And then the next day we come back, we all kind of did some work. I made like a really basic binding rotation without any placeholders or anything like that. And I made like a fold and four each. Dave made the superior fold. And then um, Steve Watt and I became back with this amazing implementation of bind with placeholders and everything that goes along with it. And so this is just the beginning of his particular implementation. Uh, I read on that a little bit, but this is actually exactly the same thing that was from, taken from his code. Uh, I probably will poorly explain it, <laughs> but Steve is here, so uh, he can uh, cover that. Um, okay, so initially we have um, our bind type. And notice, uh, and this is something I should mention in the previous slide. If you remember from um, Sorry, because Zach's question. Using the four variables, we have used type and then bind of the score, right? And that used the bind variable there, right? Uh, oh yeah, well, what I'm saying, I was just about to cover the fact that it's extern reference. So that way we don't have to actually create an instance, you know, a temporary instance at the site. And the reason why we were doing this initially was because, and the reason why it's a reference is we never actually have to instantiate the type. If we construct the type, then we would and have the to find the definition. You were using for that variable directly over there, and here you're, you're saying type and bind the score. You can directly use the bind variable on type. Oh, uh, yeah, and actually that was something I was going to cover. Yeah. You're talking about inside the, you know, the, right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, it. that's what I was about to cover. Um, so the initial auto operator, what we're doing right here is it's taking in a function, the function that you want to bind arguments to, placeholders, uh, and the series of arguments that you're binding. And um, what we're going to do is, just like before, we, we want to yield some kind of type wrapped thing. So, and the reason why it has to be type wrapped is so we can pass it along to other meta functions and have it you know, work similarly. Um, and the approach, and again, uh, this is actually Dave's idea. <laughs> if, if I am to, uh, Do I have to apologize again? You, you probably don't have to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. If you notice that yeah, inside the type angle bracket, it's bind underscore. And this is actually a, a function type if you don't recognize it. So what we're passing, what we're wrapping here is a function type that returns an instance, that returns an instance of bind and takes you know, the wrapped, uh, the function and the wrapped argument. And this is just a way to like, convert what we have into a, um, a wrap type that we can deal with. And um, so I, I guess I'll just move on. Are there any questions about that? Does that make sense or? No, I'm confused. Um, maybe I could try. I, th I think what you're, if I understand right, what you're doing is you, you have, um, you're building a function object called bind, and, and that thing has to, has to return something. <clears throat> and what it's, what it's returning is just, uh, is just a function type because you're, because the, all of the evaluation happens elsewhere. Right. So and this is just a way of packaging up the, the arguments that got passed to the outer function object, package them up into a type. So in other words, when we're using type wrapping, we obviously can only wrap one type, right? And so the approach is just to use a function type because with a function type, you can very easily pull out individual arguments from examining the type data. So that was just one approach. Again, you can change it. But <laughs> okay, so moving on, we have uh, you know the outer layer of apply, and we just provided a uh, or Steve has provided uh, apply info, which you know just forwards it out to me. You know, so you can overload it for bind and for regular meta function. And uh, make is just a utility function that takes a wrap type and yields a reference to whatever is wrapped. The purpose of this is just that up here, I mean, we have the expression, we have the type bind, but the operator parentheses is overloaded for bind underscore, not for type wrap bind underscore, obviously. So very often, what you have to do, which you see right down here, is you just call make yields a reference to that, which you can then pass the arguments to. And that's just kind of like a, a, a convenience. And so here's the, 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 the very simple implementation of apply. And that is, it takes some kind of uh, simple function object, it could be like fold, something that doesn't, that isn't in return of bind. And um, the way that it's applied is you just get a reference to an instance of it and then pass the arguments. 
Oh yeah, and before I go any further, yeah, the reason why we need apply again is because um, these bind objects, much like in the MPL, these bind objects don't behave in a similar man manner to functions. You need some kind of level of indirection in order to apply them, because they don't have, you know, overloaded operators with forwarding or anything like that. So it's, it's just a level of indirection. Okay, so here's the actual implementation for something that has bound arguments. Um, first off, we're just detecting if it's, you know, if what we're applying is an actual bond, uh, actual bound function. And um, we're just gonna, for convenience, we're gonna forward the implementation off to here. And this is just so we get a different name for overload resolution and for other things. Um, here's our basis case. Um, if we're using bind impl with just, you know, some, something that doesn't match this, some non, you know, bind expression, then when you apply a certain number of arguments, you just yield whatever the argument was there. And if this seems a little bit odd, this is, um, you can compare it to if you've ever used Phoenix or anything like that. Uh, you have like these concepts of, you know, you just wrap something in value. And those are actually function objects. And when you apply the function object, you just yield the value that was there. And that's basically what this is. And um, the other thing is, no matter how many arguments you pass to that, you're always just going to yield the value that was passed in. They're just ignored if they're extra. Um, and so here's the actual bind impl that's interesting. <laughs> and that is, if we have, um, if we need to kind of recurse in a way that accounts for the fact that if we're binding other bind expressions, we need to actual ha actually handle those correctly and expand those out with the arguments that are passed to the function. So the first thing we do is we have to apply the function object that's passed in case that's something like a bind expression passing through the arguments, and then we have to expand out all of those bind expressions and pass those as arguments as well. Is this, is, is, do people follow this, or is this a little strange? Okay. It's a little strange. Yeah. It's a little strange, but it, it should make sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. So, um, but what's bind without placeholders, right? So uh, here's the declaration for arg underscore, which is pretty much equivalent to something like underscore one in uh, boost bind or arg one in you know, the arg types in uh, Phoenix. Uh, we provide a little helper function, which uh, we just call arg open bracket one, and then you know, that, and it just yields a type wrapped arg. Because again, we always want to deal with type wrapped data. And before I even touch on that, we do provide, obviously, helper, you know, underscore one, underscore two, underscore three, so that way you don't have to always use that function. Um, so here's the implementation of, of bind with uh, arguments, and that is if the current thing that you're expanding is arg1, and you have the remaining arguments in the list, front, tail, uh, then you want to yield the first argument, because that's obviously, you know, we're trying to evaluate that for score one. So that's all this stuff, it just returns fr, which is the front of the argument. But to handle um, the general case of argn, n, all we do is we take front, chop it off, take n minus one, so for instance, if this is like the third argument, we pass it down to n minus, n minus one, which is two, chop off the head of the arguments, you reach down to n, you know, arg2, you go down to arg1, which eventually picks up the basis case up there, which is just the front of the argument list, and you'll get your result. So this actually effectively works. It's a completely working bind with invasion. That works with um, places. And again, this is all Steve Levin's work. And here's a very basic transform that's just built around fold. Um, and we're using bind here. Uh, somewhat self-explanatory to start. <laughs> fold, um, the function object that we're using is a back inserter, so that way um, we're just gonna use the initial state of just an empty vector. And then 
at each uh, element, we're just going to push back that current element with the transforming function applied to it. <coughs> and if you're familiar with um, you know, Phoenix or Boostland or, or Boostbind, this should seem pretty similar to something that you could potentially write. To. Is that okay? Does everybody see this implementation? Okay, so again, um, we just want to give a, a quick comparison of the syntax. And even though we didn't accomplish uh, bringing down compile times, I think we definitely accomplished making things more readable. And again, this is just a very simple operation in FDL. And we're just pushing back a long, long into a vector in float, <coughs> going in front of it. We've got all these angle brackets, we've got colon, colon type, colon, colon type. So anybody who's new to the language, or people who aren't new to the language and did not do metaprogramming, this is very intimidating. Yeah. And here's our approach. Much cleaner. <laughs> um, right here, uh, it, well, first of all, what's very obvious is there's no angle brackets at all, there's no colon colon type. It looks like a function call, which is what it is. Uh, the, difference, the other difference here is that, you notice, we can no longer pass int and float. Because again, these are uh, these are actual function calls, and you can't pass type to a function. You can pass type to a template, you can't pass type to a function. So all int underscore open close parentheses is it's just a function that yields a type wrapping. But in all fairness, you also need to add decal type. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm gonna get to that. I, I, I show a couple of comparisons, and it just for formatting issues, it was a little weird. And yeah, we have the, the macro, which makes it a little bit nicer. So yeah, in all fairness, yes, around this expression, you'd have macro that just says, you know, eval, or boost F FTMPL, FTMPL um, on ramp. Is it possible to disagree with you? What was it? <laughs> <laughs> to disagree with you. You said the below is much clearer and much more readable. Mm -hmm. Personally, I oh, the don't know. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, I guess everybody's entitled to their opinion. Well, uh, what about it is uh, less readable? Pardon? What about it is less readable? Or? And more, the, the more it's not as necessarily a, as a readable. The, the above, I, I immediately understand. Okay. Below, I have to think what's going on there. Well, I now had, did have a presentation. But, uh, I don't know if it's more readable. Okay, well... I guess everybody's entitled to opinion. The only reason why I claim that it's more readable is because that's function syntax, which anybody who's even a beginner in the language will be able to recognize, oh, this is a function call. And that's all a meta function really should be, is at least at the high level in terms of thinking about it, is it's a function call. Somebody new to the language sees that. They don't know what that is at all. So perhaps readable, you're entitled to your opinion, but I will say that that's a little bit more consistent, and I think somebody new to the language will understand it a little bit better. The other thing is that once some compiler implements template aliases for the first time, the double column type can be removed from the top. So that would make that more readable. Um, I'm not sure if that's entirely true. I mean, I, the, re the reason why the type there is necessary is... Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying that... I mean, in general, template aliases remove the need to have these helper structs that have double colon type. You can just say, you no, know, it's 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 but you, can't, you also can't specialize template aliases. You can't do things like that. But you can't have a template alias for something. It defines the it's, it's, That is true. He's right. He's right. Okay. He's right. Okay. okay, okay. Uh, if only a compiler actually existed. <laughs> that's okay. it's, it's um, a crazy idea. Yeah. Okay. So the other issue is. Type game. Here's the exact same thing. Only instead of float, uh, instead of hints, I used R. We're just assuming that we're in some kind of dependent context of RB. We're inside a template. RB some kind of parameter. I'm just going to need to write type name, type name. Everybody take type name. But again, template aliases would need that. What? I don't know. Huh? Concepts would have needed that. But template yeah. aliases. No, template aliases know. also get rid of the type name. I because see because you, can see that, you can see that it's an alias. But you can't because you don't know what you're instantiating. You can't know that it's a type. Can you still need this information. Well, the whole point of template aliases is, is that they're always types. No. No, no, no. no. That's, no, no, no. that's, that's true, right? Template. Well, he's talking about OX template aliases. Oh, the OX feature. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with what you mean, right? 
Yeah. In other words, using so that way you have uh, an alias for another template, mm -hmm. and when you use it, it actually it is basically like a type that, right? Yeah. So when I see that, I know it's a type, so I don't need any type. Oh, you're saying if there was no colon colon type? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Both this is just going back to the colon colon. Right. Yes. right, right. Really? Yeah. yeah. It moves the type name into the definition of the alias. Yeah. So effectively, so okay. Once instead. Of well, either way, here's the parse syntax that didn't even change, which I think is, is great. So, barring uh, temple aliases, this still is, is much better. Um, now I'm just going to go over briefly what are currently... Can you back up? Yes, sure. What is R to lowercase a? Oh, that's just... Okay, normally up here we're inside the context of a template. Yes. And I have capital R because that's the temple argument. That's the type? Right. So here, I'm, again, I'm not showing the context, but we're assuming that that's some argument that's passed into this, you know, higher level function template, just like, just like this is some higher level meta function. So R is, for instance, it might have been passed in there. It's the name of the parameter to the. Uh, it's, just, it's just the parameter to the, parameter to the, to the surrounding function. Okay. Okay. But you also you need to define it so that R is ostensibly uh, a function or the R type of a function. Arg could be, yeah, whatever argument is there. No, it's so. a type wrapped value. Right, it's, it's, it's a, a type, type wrapped type. It's just like, it's just, it's the equivalent of what arg is up there, only instead of it being passed directly as a template argument, it's an argument to a function template. It's just that in, in this whole kind of subset of way of looking at metaprogramming, we always use uh, arguments wrapped in decal type as opposed to the type itself. And again, the benefit of that despite the fact that we haven't really improved performance, uh, performance, at least not much, um, is just that it actually uses function syntax, which I guess arguably is good or not good. Okay, so before I want to go further, I'm just going to go over some, uh, what we have right now. Current libraries, we have SDL, runtime homogenous containers and iterators. Uh, I guess I duplicated that there. Uh, runtime algorithms. We have MPL, compile time versions of containers, file time versions of algorithms, compile time lambda expressions, it's model that for the SDL, limited runtime interaction. Pretty much the runtime interaction is uh, MPL for each, which is just a quick way of, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with it. It's a way of visiting each type and applying some runtime function to it. And then we have Boost Fusion, which is, you know, ap aptly by the name, is kind of a mix of these concepts in a way. It's uh, partially runtime heterogeneous containers, so you can have, for instance, tuple or you know, fusion vectors. Um, internally, uh, a lot of uh, fusion types actually model boost MPL concept. For instance, uh, a fusion vector is a MPL sequence. Um, it includes algorithms for heterogeneous containers, and it operates on types and runtime values. So um, the first thing I'm going to say is, is this redundant? And I would argue that it can be considered redundant. And by that I mean, if Fusion can operate on compile time and runtime values, and if you can wrap everything in kind of decal type ex uh, expressions, then isn't it possible to, in very many cases, use a library like Fusion, but instead of implementing Fusion with MPL, implement it entirely with decal type, use it with type wrap data, and decal type that, get the equivalent of what MPL does. Is it anybody, do people follow this, or? Yeah. I'm really worried about trying to pass something that can't be instantiated. Oh, okay. because, uh, that's the other thing, yeah. Because it's really we hard pretty to pretty much gave up on that. Yeah. I, I didn't mention that. Uh, initially, because, because we realized that, um, not having definitions of like the wrap type, for instance, wasn't really gaining us anything. Uh, we reinserted the definition, so you can safely store it into you know it's copyable. It's it has a definition. It can be instantiated. So. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm not necessarily saying this is a good idea. I'm just saying it's something to think about. It, it, it is a possibility to actually have some kind of fusion library. And I, um, uh, and as an example of this, I'm, I'm gonna show transform. I, I was going to talk about lambda expressions, as I you know, mentioned earlier on. 
Here's how you would write a transform operation in SQL. You have vector C, one, two, three, four, five, six. And all we're going to do is use transform to freeze five, seven, nine. Okay? So there's MPL in underscore one underscore two. So and it jumps out name plus. And it also again doesn't look like a uh, function call. It's a little confusing. Here's an actual implementation that works using our syntax. It's a, it's much cleaner. The only thing is we still unfortunately have angle brackets because even with um, const expert, you can't really get rid of passing those, although Doug has pointed out that there may be some way, some really tricky way to um, eliminate the need for angle brackets there. But I think what's interesting here is because we're using objects, we're actually able to avoid having to use name plus functions and things like that, and actually have um, uh, lambda expressions that look exactly the same as, for instance, Phoenix lambda expressions. And in fact, this example right here is compilable, and it's just fusion and Phoenix. And the only thing that I did to modify Phoenix here was currently Phoenix doesn't under the underneath the hood use decal type, and so I just modified it a little bit to actually make it use decal type when evaluating lambda expressions. And so vector C was actually just a loop wrapper around make vector. And that's how we get that. So I think what's interesting about this is when you look at MPL as it is today, we have a lot of stuff implemented that has an equivalent on the runtime side, for instance, lambda expression. But it's possible to use Phoenix as it is, or slightly modified, and get the same type of behavior and use it for metaprogramming. So you know, there may not be a need to use something like uh, MPL Lambda. And it is more consistent. There are some drawbacks to this, but. Well, the main issue I have is like, what if you have, want to have pass, do something with the back, MPL vector of an abstract type? What's that? If you have an abstract type in your MPL vector, now you cannot create a fusion vector of that. Well, they're all type wrapped. Right, right. So they're, they're all type wrapped. Uh, keep in mind that, um, uh, I'll go to, go to this. Notice that I'm using that integral C wrapper. That's, oh. that's actually from our library, and that returns a type wrap to integral C. Similarly, if you're working with abstract type, it's not like you're actually storing those abstract types in the, MPL, in the uh, fusion vector. You're storing just, you know, that's just a template argument to a completely empty type. You're only using it for type information. Right. Yeah. So if you don't actually instantiate the fusion vector, you should be able to. No, no, you can, you can instantiate it. You can instantiate it, is right. the point. This type wrapper is just an empty struct. Right, no, it's, it's saying, like an identity. Right. If you don't instantiate the fusion vector. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, you can, you can still do that. You can. Because it's just empty fusion. type. Yeah. And it's, there's no problem with that. Because you're not, instantiating the vector is not instantiate, try, attempting to instantiate abstract types. <coughs> it's just some, it's instantiating some empty type. So you could, and there are actually reasons why you might eventually want to do that, and I'll mention that. Okay, and there, yeah, transform here in the previous slide was. I already covered this. It's just these, tra uh, these fusion transform and lambda expressions are there. Which I think is a great thing. Note about boost fusion, I already kind of just covered that. Um, and before I go further, why I, I want to ask this question why is MPL implemented as it is today? I mean, this is a very vague question. I don't expect really <laughs> anybody to genuinely know what I'm talking about. But what I mean to say is the reason why MPL is implemented as it is is because. That's the only way that it really could have been implemented. And even though the work that we did may not be the best approach, I think it should be looked into and other approaches should be looked into because now with decal type and auto, we actually have alternatives and we don't have to default to an MPL style approach. And uh, like you were saying, with template aliases, I mean, I mean stuff does look nicer. So. Um, Take confusion further. Um, this is just uh, an example. I rewrote uh, add pointer, the type trait add pointer. And I'm just using this as an example. Once again, this is just using um, boost fusion. I made add pointer just a compliant you know, function object, except uh, so it's returning a type wrap, for instance, uh, ink pointer, type wrap, float pointer, type wrap, double pointer. 
and then we're just getting the second element too, which would be a double element. And this actually completely works, and the result that we get is oh, okay. that's not anymore. It's just the double point. And I think what's interesting about this is currently as we are today, we have MPL transform, we have fusion transform, but I wonder if they could be unified. And that's kind of what I'm you know getting at here is it may not be necessary to maintain two libraries in the future, but depending on compile time, you know, that might not be an actual uh, So over overall goals. Uh, again, this is hypothetical. I'm not saying that this is possible or <laughs> you know that we should do this, but it's something to think about. Can we and should we have a single unified library for MPL fusion? Um, if we did, we want it to be generic at the lowest possible level. We need to overlap with specifically for metaprogramming. By that I mean uh, the examples before. It's not like we had um, a specialization for using type wrapped types inside of MPLP or inside of Boost Fusion. We were just using Boost Fusion, one single implementation for transform, and we were just using it with wrap type. It's a very simple idea when you think about it. But that's what I mean when I say no, no overload specifically for metaprogramming. It's not like we're talking about having a, the same name function. We're talking about using the exact same code and you're wrapping it in metaprogram. Uh, obviously, we don't want any runtime penalty with the Fusion side, which obviously you, know, you can't really imagine why it would be the case. But I just put it in there. We want to avoid redundancy, minimal compile time penalty, but that's probably not possible. <clears throat> yeah. So last year there was some discussion about the um, the fact that uh, all of that type information that we real, what we really needed was a canonical uh, type. Right. Uh, yeah. This um, is claim. And that Doug was implementing that in claim. Is that? Did you hear that same thing, David? Uh, Yes, and GCC has a canonical type system, and as of 4. Point, GCC 4.5, they've actually started hashing based on it, which is the right way to improve performance. And this is why so it's Zach's, gotten much better. Um, Zach's timing was improved so much. From, when we were testing it last year, we were getting in, in unimaginable compile times, and it was just completely unmaintainable. So that's the reason why there was a speed up in the test. For so the current implementation of MPL should be sped up in round numbers about the same as the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's true. Yeah. Okay. So if we wanted to go ahead and unify and build fusion, what you'd need are just generic algorithms, full transforms where you find count, which all already exist. I mean, we don't have to lift any concepts. We're just using exactly fusion as it is. There are some differences. For instance, I think I only made a slide. We can't exactly use count. And I don't know. Anybody immediately sees why this is. And this is why I say this is kind of like a hypothetical more than it is um, you know, something that we could probably pursue. And that is the reason why you can't use count is because count and fusion obviously yields a runtime value. So if you want to use it in a way that an MPL count would work, you want to yield some kind of M, you know, MPL integral constant. And I mean, it's possible to, to actual, actually provide a specialization when it's working on type, type wrap thing accomplish that, but it just becomes apparent that, you know, is, is that really something that we want to pursue? And I'd say probably not. It's, it's really, I think what you're saying is it's just a um, question of whether you need those two different functions to have the same name. Yeah, that's true. You could also use two different named functions as well. And yeah, the only reason why you want similar named function is just it's one less thing to learn as you know a programmer, and as long as it doesn't make it so that you know it's it's confusing to use, um, I think it would be okay to have the same name. But yeah, you, you probably you might not want it to have the same exact name. So. But yeah, but in the end, the point is it, it is possible to implement these types of things just using something like Fusion, and if you did that, you wouldn't have to depend on that field. Um, so the way you'd have to do that is you'd have to rewrite Fusion to not depend on MPL. You make meta functions like the add pointer and stuff like that, type trace. Um, now the function objects and you just use them with decal type. And Phoenix would have to be updated to use decal type. Um, the only difference is when you're using it for metaprogramming, you wrap it with this type wrapper, otherwise you just use it regularly. And um, the final thing is if you have no MPL, uh, 
I just think this is kind of a curiosity here. Um, uh, uh, Fusion Vector, I believe, has an nested type that's called types, which is used an MPL vector of um, all the types that are in it. And if if you want to avoid using the MPL, you could still do that exact same thing. Only now, you know, you're going back to our approach. You're just making the nested types another fusion vector, only it's of type wrap types. And the benefit of that is, again, you can use all the exact same algorithms that you're using in fusion instead of having to use MPL, which eliminates an entire set of redundant functionality. Uh, but is it worth, worth it? What are the downsides? Uh, it requires C++ compiler, requires partial rewriting of fusion. Um, MPL, I believe, is widely used. So it's, is it worth doing something like that? It's kind of questionable. Um, everything that we have that, that works with meta functions up to this day already uses, you know, MPL style meta functions, type traits, things like that. Is it worth, you know, having to change things? Probably not. Um, MPL is more lightweight than fusion. And I mean, that's apparent. Fusion, you know, it's not just um, type sequences. It also, when you instantiate a fusion vector, you know, you, there's much more that's pulled in. So that can affect the compile time. So we don't have any, you know, really great tests that show exactly how it is. And compilers aren't optimizing for it. And compilers aren't going to do that a lot of C++ OS yet. So it's kind of tough. And again, we didn't really increase compile times. And I wrote plain say this because <laughs> there's still a chance that, you know, we can see decreased compile times, so I'm not sure how possible it is. Um, just, I guess, questions. I don't know, I think, did anybody know uh, what time this is supposed to end? Six. Six? Okay, so we have, we have some time for questions. Actually, this is more close. Um, anyone who's interested in Phoenix and <coughs> that it's built on top of the Jekyll type, uh, particularly you, Matt, like you've done. I have a, a talk about it on. I guess maybe I missed this. So in a fusion vector, when you instantiate, you actually instantiate the, the actual types. And in, in your case, you would be instantiating the wrap types, right? Right. And so also keep in mind that whenever you're working with it, this is all wrapped in a decal type expression. So there's, there's literally no, there's nothing actually being, there's no objects being created at runtime. It's all just equivalent to a type. Well, in fusion, you often want to create the, the actual types, right? The, the actual. Oh, back yeah, that's actually something I didn't mention. Um, yeah, going back to how I was saying that MPL has very limited runtime functionality, you have like four each. You, that, that was the reason why I was saying why you might actually want to instantiate one of these things. If you could have it wrapped in decal type, or you could instantiate it, and if you do that, all of a sudden you can use Fusion for each instead of using MPL for each. But not only that, you can use all of the Fusion uh, algorithms that are included and have it visit types. You no longer have to deal with that. So you have the MPL again that just has for each, but you use fusion and all of a sudden you get all of those. But in your unified world where you unify MPL and, and fusion, yep. the your unified vector, what would it instantiate? What I guess I'm not entirely sure what <laughs> it's it's doing the exact same thing that fusion would be. It's just instantiating type wrap things that are just empty empty types. But then you're not getting the actual instance. You, you don't well you of the actual you type. Can you can take the wrap you them can, and use it as an MPL or not wrap them and use it as a location. Right, yeah, exactly. That's the point. You can you can, if you wrap if you wrap your types, then you're using it for oh, yeah. If you don't, then it's I mean we're not changing anything in fusion in that sense. I see. Right. In fact, there's very little change to fusion at all. It's pretty much no change to fusion. So you keep the fusion vectors or just add your own vectors essentially that way. Well, well that's the thing, we're not even adding our own vectors. We're just using fusion vectors and just working with wrap to wrap types, which are just empty. And we're just Basically, the whole point is we're just using Fusion, um, only the results of all of its functions. We're just not using it for anything else other than the results. It kind of seems like you're just replacing the distinction between Fusion and MPL with Fusion with regular types and Fusion with graph types. Right. And the other thing is that some of the Fusion algorithms, like you mentioned counters, but also like push back. The semantics of that are totally different because it creates a joint view. But which is kind of is it, the way that you'd access the nested type, it doesn't actually matter that it creates a joint view because the way you'd access the nested type is you do at C. So I understand what you're saying. In other words, 
it creates some kind of complicated it's a thing yeah. of references. And, and, and when you start adding joint views, they become, my experience is that they Compositive. tend to be very difficult to manipulate efficiently versus the MPL representation. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, I mean, it will still work is the point. But yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. It's gonna be, yeah, it's still gonna be complicated, but it's possible. Uh, any other questions?